Now to another question. What fragments would the peptide from the previous slide give if it were treated with trypsin and with chymotrypsin? I'm going to give you the answer, of course, but if you want, you can pause it and think about this for a moment. So here's our answer. I want you to remember from two slides ago that trypsin cleaves to the right of lysine and to the right of arginine. So here's our peptide from the previous example. What trypsin will do is it will come down here and find anywhere that there's an arginine and it will break the bond to the right. And anywhere there's a lysine, it will break the bond to the right. As we scroll down here, we can see there are no lysines. There is an arginine, however. So trypsin will clip this bond. What fragments does that make? It makes one fragment, arginine, and then this other huge fragment, proline, leucine, glycine, isoleucine, and valine. Does that make sense? Let's see if we can answer the next question for chymotrypsin. All right. We should remember once again from our previous slide that chymotrypsin cleaves peptides to the right of phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan. So for our peptide in question, we scan down here and try to find phenylalanine, tyrosine, or tryptophan. We scan and scan and scan and scan, and you can see that none of these amino acids are found in this peptide. Hence, well, chymotrypsin is not going to cleave this thing anywhere. So the final fragment that we'd get is actually the exact same peptide that we started with. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> So I just wanted to show you a computer-generated model of a protein. Now, when I first saw this kind of model back when I was a young undergraduate, I couldn't help but ask myself questions like, what are these purple coils and these green arrows and these twisty green tube-looking things? What in the world is all this stuff? Well, as it turns out, each one of these colored components represents a different part of the protein's secondary structure. Jumping back to our zoomed out geography analogy from before, a protein's secondary structure is a slightly zoomed out way of describing uh, or seeing a protein. Simply defined, a protein's secondary structure is the way in which its various peptide segments orient into a regular pattern. The three categories of structural patterns are the alpha helix, beta pleated sheet, and the coil or loop conformation. I'm going to introduce you to these right now. An alpha helix looks kind of like this. So you see this twisty green structure here. This twisty green structure represents uh, hydrogen bonds that are being formed by a twisting backbone of amino acids in our peptide. So this is essentially our peptide wrapped around where there are hydrogen bonds stabilizing it in the middle. This is a sideways view of it. So once again, this twisty green section is a peptide that's twisting into a coil. And that is a type of secondary structure that's often seen in proteins. They are stabilized by hydrogen bonds. The next type of secondary structure is a beta pleated sheet. Now you can see that what happens is if, if we have our peptide with its amino acids looking like this and another section of our peptide that might have been folded over somewhere over here and then is wrapping back and the hydrogen bond in this kind of manner, they form this type of beta pleated sheet which is called a parallel beta pleated sheet because the N termini are found on the same end and the C termini are found on the same end. You can also imagine having an anti-parallel beta pleated sheet, which would be the converse of direction. I really don't and will not require you guys to know any of these uh, rigid details regarding secondary structure. I just want to make sure that I introduce them to you. Now, I just want to point out one more thing. As we look at this protein structure I was showing you before, you see these little coils? These coils represent individual amino acids in a sequence they're hydrogen bonding in such a way that they coil. These arrows represent parallel or anti-parallel beta pleated sheets that are once again uh, regions of uh, amino acids here in the peptide that are forming those complementary hydrogen bonds. And then what about all these tubes that are kind of wrapped around all funny? What are those? 
Well, those regions are just given the name coil or loop conformations. So anything that's sort of an intermediary region between an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet that doesn't really fit into one of those two categories, we just arbitrarily call a coil or loop conformation. So that is secondary structure. Once again, if you took a secondary structure and zoomed in on it, you would see individual amino acids, which are the primary structure of the peptide. You zoom out, you see a coil or a beta sheet or, uh, or a loop conformation or an alpha helix. Those are secondary structural features. As you zoom out more and see this entire type of thing, that's called the tertiary structure. So once again, I would call each of these individual components, beta sheets, alpha coil, or alpha helices, or coils, or loop conformations, secondary structures. This entire thing all clustered together in one beautiful picture of a protein is called the protein's tertiary structure. Let me expound on that right here. Tertiary structure really is a zoomed out version that has uh, coils, alpha helices, and beta sheets all being shown here. And if we once again were able to zoom in more closely, we would see the individual amino acids that make these coils, helices, and sheets a reality. In essence, once again, we could say that this zoomed out picture is the tertiary structure of this protein. A couple of details about tertiary structure. The stabilizing interactions that occur to enable coils and helices and uh, sheets to obtain the rigidity or conformations that they have are centered on the uh, presence of intermolecular interactions, which include covalent bonds, hydrogen bonds, electrostatic interactions like London forces, Van der Waals forces, and hydrophobic interactions. And when I say covalent bonds here, there is a qualifier. The only type of covalent bond that exists across a peptide, from one part of a peptide into another part, is a disulfide bridge that we talked about before. So that summarizes tertiary structure. Now what about quaternary structure? If I just told you that we zoom out and see the entire protein and that's its tertiary structure, then what in the world is quaternary structure? Well, as it turns out, there are some proteins that actually have multiple parts that each individually are tertiary structures. And all of those combine together to form a full humongous protein. That is a protein that has quaternary structure. And it turns out, not all proteins have quaternary structure. The only proteins that have quaternary structure are proteins that have more than one polypeptide chain. So if you have a protein that really is only one polypeptide chain twisting around in one big long uh, pile of coils and loops and helices, that cannot possibly have quaternary structure. But if you have a protein that has multiple polypeptide chains all individually forming different sections of the protein, then you can say that type of protein has a quaternary structure. Each of those sections could individually be considered a tertiary structure description of the protein. And then the protein as a whole would be called, uh, or zoomed out to see all of those together, would be uh, a way of describing uh, the protein at a quaternary level. As it turns out, proteins that have more than one polypeptide chain are called oligomers. And their individual chains are called subunits. So I could look at one big cluster and say that's an alpha subunit and this is a beta subunit and they interact together to form this protein. This protein that I've shown here is hemoglobin. Now although you can't see it clearly in this uh, tangled looking figure, most varieties of hemoglobin have four separate polypeptide subunits. Uh, thus we could say that hemoglobin has a quaternary structure. Any poly, once again, any proteins that only have one polypeptide chain do not have quaternary structure. I hope that makes sense. If you want to ask me more questions about it, you're welcome to do so during class. I kind of like to think of quaternary structure sort of as being like, um, well, when I was a kid, I used to watch uh, Transformers cartoons. And there was a character named Devastator who was made up of like six different guys that all combined together to form one huge guy. 
Each of those individual guys was an individual guy by himself, but when they got together, they formed a huge robot. Quaternary structure is kind of like that. There's sort of like individual proteins almost, but they don't fully function until they get together and form this huge uh, protein like this one, hemoglobin. Anyway, hopefully that tangent was useful for those of you who like Transformers references. Now that brings us to the end of chapter 23. Finally! <laughs> and I've got to tell you, I'm exhausted. This was a long one. I look forward to talking to you guys more about this in class, but for now, I'm going to turn my attention away from amino acid and peptide chemistry and towards something that might be a little bit more or a little bit less <laughs> mentally demanding, like researching or looking at my monthly budget reports. So until next time, I'll see you guys later.